As long as I'm president of the United States, Iran will never be allowed to have a nuclear weapon. Tensions between China and the United States have been increasing over trade, coronavirus, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and now the South China Sea. It takes a few to make war, but it takes a village and a nation to build peace. Hold Your Fire, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. Hi, I'm Rob Malley. Today on Hold Your Fire, we will not be joined by Naz. Uh, she will be uh, taking leave for a few weeks, but I'm delighted to uh, welcome Steve Pomper, who's my colleague at Crisis Group. He's the Senior Director for Policy, also somebody I worked with very closely in the Obama administration. Steve, delighted to have you. Thanks so much for having me. I'm glad to be here. And what we're going to be talking about today in, our, in the main segment of our, of our show is the risks of election-related violence in the U.S., We'll be joined by Rachel Kleinfeld, who is an expert on this, and it promises to be a fascinating, if somewhat troubling, conversation. Um, and Steve, I know you've worked with us on this issue as well. Uh, we issued a statement on the risks of violence. And so much could happen in terms of foreign policy decisions that President Trump might take in the days, he has taken some in the weeks, but in the days before the election, and that he might take after the election. And an amazing event that encapsulates much of the Trump presidency happened just a few days ago that relates to what I just said. And so we want to play a clip now. They're also poor. Iran is poor. Hamas is poor. They're all poor. And they weren't poor three years ago. They were blowing everything up. They're very poor. Uh, do you think Sleepy Joe could have made this deal, baby? Sleepy Joe. I think, uh, do you think he would have made this deal somehow? I don't think so. For those of you who may not know, that was a conversation that was recorded live. Uh, the president, who was announcing this deal between Sudan and Israel, a deal where they're going to, you know, it's not a full normalization deal, but in, in, the, in the spirit of trying to improve relations between Arab countries and Israel that President Trump has been pushing. And in this call, he tries to get Prime Minister Netanyahu, who's on the line, to basically denounce his opponent, Vice President Biden, and Netanyahu wisely demurs. He also, in the same conversation, which was with uh, the Sudanese prime minister, basically said, you know, Egypt might have to blow up Ethiopia's dam because Ethiopia refused the deal that I, President Trump, put on the table. So I listened to this, and it was sort of Trumpism 101 in terms of him wanting to air this conversation publicly, and then everything he said, trying to announce the deal, being upset because the deal wasn't made, and therefore threatening indirectly Ethiopia with some kind of retribution. What did you make of it? So I think throw this one in the time capsule when they do the history of the Trump presidency. This will be a fantastic exhibit. It does encapsulate, as you were saying, so many different elements of his foreign policy, uh, many of which I think will strike more traditional observers of U.S. foreign policy is a bit perverse. I mean, just to set the scene, the administration actually took a number of, of very significant steps last week with regard to Sudan policy, with regard to sort of fostering this deal between Sudan and Israel that really were quite notable. So at the beginning of the week, after months of work, the administration announced that it would be taking Sudan off the state sponsor of terrorism list, which is basically the, the United States' biggest penalty box for countries that it wants to describe as rogue. You become a state sponsor of terrorism when the State Department determines that a country has engaged in acts of international terrorism at a sufficient volume. And once on the list, certain penalties apply, sanctions, directed voting against the country at international institutions, etc., so it's a big deal to come off the list. And, and Sudan, which, of course, has been in a process of political transition, is being strangulated economically, needs a lift in order to make that transition work, has been a very good candidate for rescission of this ignominious label for a long time. The administration had been working on it, but it clearly had created a link between this rescission and the deal that was announced on Friday, which was that Sudan was going to recognize Israel, that they were going to thaw what had been basically a formerly belligerent posture that had been in place for decades. So a lot, of, a lot of business being done. That linkage in and of itself was probably a little bit forced. I mean, in a perfect world, 
uh, the United States would take Sudan off the state sponsors list because it's not a state sponsor of terrorism and because... A little bit dangerous too, right? To the extent politically that it might put the Sudanese prime minister at odds with his public opinion. Yeah, the Sudanese didn't want to do this. I mean, they, they wanted to be, come off the list, but it was clear that they were worried that there was going to be a political backlash domestically from people who identified with the Palestinian cause that, that could really be dangerous to the, to the civilian government there. But they were strong-armed by the U.S. and I think by the Saudis as well, if the reporting is correct, and finally came around to the deal. So the deal gets announced uh, over the course of the week. They announced the rescission, and then the, the thawing of relations gets announced on Friday. In order to make the announcement, the president gathers in the Oval Office all of his you know, top foreign policy advisors. It's a gallery of predominantly, if not exclusively, white men. So again, for the time capsule, just a total lack of diversity in this administration, standing around the president who sits at the resolute desk with the leadership. I think he had both the civilian and the military leadership from the Sudanese transitional government and Netanyahu on the phone. And the sycophancy in that room was just stunning. It was like you would expect no less of the sort of pull-up bureau around Kim Jong-un, you know, the the leaders of the, the National Security Advisor, Jared Kushner, uh, the head of the Treasury Department, Mike Pompeo from the State Department, all go around and attest to the brilliant leadership of the President of the United States and how he's an unheralded peacemaker, and it's extraordinary. And then, of course, not to be outdone, the President <laughs> gets on the phone with these foreign leaders and toots his own horn similarly, saying how spectacular an accomplishment this was. And then setting up the clip that, that we just played, you know, tries to get... Netanyahu to validate him in this respect, says, you know, gosh, Bibi, you know, nobody else could have done this. Certainly Sleepy Joe couldn't have done this. And Bibi, being nobody's fool, knows that, you know, we don't know how that election is going to go next week, chooses not to antagonize who may very well be the next president of the United States and sort of does a little bit of a two-step and steps away from, from that. And we, we only played the audio clip. If you see it in person, you could see how annoyed President Trump is that Netanyahu doesn't join him in condemning uh, uh, Joe Biden sort of says, OK, let's get to the next question because this guy doesn't uh, doesn't want to join me in in this. The president then just for no reason whatsoever created this international incident by raising the question of the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, which is this enormous project um, on the Blue Nile, the main tributary of the Nile that Ethiopia has been working on for years. It's been a source of great friction between Ethiopia, which wants to use this to basically harness what it believes is its riparian birthright with respect to the to the Nile, and which the Egyptians and the Sudanese downstream see as a uh, an almost existential threat, certainly in the Egyptians' case, because they get so much of their water from the Nile and they worry that the dam is going to divert that. So uh, it's a very tense situation. It needs to be handled with great aplomb. And Trump, for no seemingly no reason whatsoever, blunders into it by s suggesting to the Sudanese prime minister that, you know, the Ethiopians have just gotten this completely wrong and that the Egyptians, if the issue isn't solved, are going to have to take matters into their own hands and almost seems to be validating the idea that it would be legitimate for the Egyptians to take a strike on the dam, which, of course, is just an astronomically reckless and irresponsible thing to say, and extremely both unhelpful to U.S. sort of Africa policy and revealing in that regard. And what was, I mean, part of what was revealing was that what I think prompted him to say it was not any particular concern about the dam, but the fact that he had this deal, which he would have liked to be able to present before the election, that's at least my interpretation, and he was frustrated because of Ethiopia, in his view, walking away. But that, that makes me think, you know, you started off by saying, and I think we have to be fair, that some of what the president has been doing, you know, are accomplishments. You could, could second guess them, you could say that they're not as much as he would like them to be, but the normalization between the UAE and Israel, which we've spoken about in a prior podcast between um, Bahrain and Israel, now Sudan. He had this strange event between Kosovo and Serbia. He's gotten some American detained in Yemen back home. It's clear that in the run-up to the election, he's trying to run up the scoreboard and try to see how much he could do that he would be able to present to the electorate as achievements. And again, some of them are things that his predecessors had tried and, and failed. The flip side, if he loses the election, which is at least, according to polls, a, a fair possibility, what will his mood be then? Will he try to rake up more accomplishments or will he be in the mood of sort of uh, scorched earth policy and say, you know, I'm going to leave a disaster for my successor? And uh, there are some things he may try to do, maybe not even leave a disaster, but try to prevent then President Biden or President Biden to be from doing what he would want to do. And I just wonder, to the extent we could psychologize President Trump, 
What do you think his instinct would be between the time he loses and the time he leaves office if that were to t- take place? So I guess I've been less worried about this than maybe some others have. I mean, my assumption has been that Trump's big focus has been on winning the election and racking up points, you know, in the run up to the election. So as you're saying here, you know, he wants to be seen as the great peacemaker and that stunt in the Oval Office. I mean, the diplomatic accomplishments and the decisions with regard to rescission, I think, are significant. The linkage in this particular case may be a little bit troubling. But in general, I agree with you. Some of these things are real accomplishments. My sense of the guy is that his focus is really winning, winning, winning. If he doesn't win, I would be more worried, I think, if there was, so, for example, a John Bolton in the position of the National Security Advisor, somebody who had a huge ideological agenda was sitting in the White House and might be thinking about, OK, how do I put certain points on the board that are going to be very difficult for the next administration to erase? I don't think O'Brien is that guy uh, who's the current National Security Advisor. There would be others in the administration who would be you know, tempted to try and do certain things. But to be honest, as I look back at the last year, I think they've been doing them already. Like if I look at Mike Pompeo's effort to create this unalienable rights commission to rewrite the framework of human rights, that's sort of already in progress. You know, they've done that. So that isn't something that I'm especially worried about. But what about you? I'm slightly more worried than you. I'm not, I'm not an alarmist, but I think there's some issues on which, uh, and I think of Iran in particular, he may try to put up more obstacles to, um, to Biden. But before we get there, we're going to have to get through the election. And that's obviously what we are here to talk about today with our guests. We're really excited that we have today Rachel Kleinfeld, who's done tremendous work on this issue. Steve has done work as well. So uh, we'll turn to that now. Hold your fire. A podcast by the International Crisis Group. So, Steve, this brings us to the main part of our of our event today, our podcast today, which is our interview with uh, Rachel Kleinfeld. Rachel, thank you for being on our show. Thrilled to be here, Rob. So, uh, you are an expert in what we're going to talk about today, which is what are the what are the risks associated with the elections in the U.S. You are a senior fellow in the Democracy, Conflict, and Governance Program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and you know, I think as everyone knows, we are roughly a week away from the elections on November 3rd in in the U.S. And for the first time in its history, Crisis Group has decided to cover those elections because of the risks of violence. So I'd like to ask you sort of a first very general question. How worried are you that these elections might trigger some level of violence? Let me take apart that question first. So I'm very hopeful that election day itself won't be violent, that people by and large will be able to vote in a free and fair manner. We've seen, of course, sporadic instances of citizens doing things they shouldn't do. The reason we know about those is that they're getting caught. They're very random and they don't seem organized. So that's really good. In terms of post-election violence, I'm more concerned, although much less than many other Americans, I would say. If you look at the polls, about 71% of Americans are worried about post-election violence, according to the More in Common poll, a group that looks at polarization nationwide. But then if you dig deeper, their numbers that will be released tomorrow say about 3 to 4% of Americans believe violence is justified for political purposes, but the vast majority think it is not justified, do not plan to engage in it, really want to keep things peaceful. And if you think about this summer when we had really significant protests all over the country, a huge spike in June, and then significant levels throughout the summer, there was also very little violence. Um, A lot of smoke, a lot of people carrying guns, a few uh, sporadic instances that I do not want to minimize. But on the whole, we did better than we could have. And so my hope is that that's where we'll go. For for those of you know uh, who are listening to us who may not be as familiar with the U.S. system or as familiar with what's happened in the U.S., what are the factors that you would identify as the risk factors? And Steve will want to, to, to jump in because he's been digging in on those same questions for us. ICG knows the risk factors. No one knows them better than, than you all. Um, highly unequal societies, societies that uh, have a huge separation between uh, the sides, societies with a history of political violence. That is America. I mean, you were saying that this is the first time that ICG has covered American elections, but we've had violent elections um, many times in the past. It's been the more distant past, the 1800s, uh, early 1900s, rather than today. But 
our history of lynching and violence around African Americans has a lot to do with voting. If you look at when lynchings would spike, it was always right before voting periods, and it would be against African Americans, but also against the political party of Lincoln that the South didn't want. So this is a long history of using violence to keep people and their rights for civil expression and democratic expression suppressed, and so we're at risk. We have been at risk a long time, but had stronger resilience factors. So if you balance that risk against our strong institutions, our strong courts that were considered very nonpartisan, our military and security institutions that were considered nonpartisan, that kept the peace for quite a while. But all of that has been decaying in recent years. Our Congress has not been a deliberative body really for 25 years. It's been much more partisan, much more parliamentary. Our courts are now considered highly, highly politicized, especially the Supreme Court. I don't have to say that here, but also our federal courts and appeals courts. And our political parties have gotten weaker and weaker. And that's led in a political entrepreneur like Donald Trump, who has been inciting violence. And what you tend to see is you've got all these risk factors, you have your resilience factors, and then you need a spark to catch the tinder. And Donald Trump has been that spark. He's been really using rhetoric to uh, incite anger and violence and ever since his campaigns in 2016. So when we went through our analysis, Rachel, and you probably saw the statement that we put out last week on this topic, it very much tracked what you just said. And we sort of added up the risk factors as looking at polarization, looking at the risk of contestation. We also concluded that the Donald Trump factor was really what took this election to a different place than at least recent history has put us. But the other piece of it um, that I wonder if you could talk about a little bit was the role of non-state actors, you know, these groups that have formed um, on the fringes of American political life, but seem to be becoming more virulent, at least in the views of even the government's own experts on this. So I'm talking about white supremacy organizations, hate groups, mostly on the right, though there are also some on the on other fringes of political life as well. And they seem, particularly the ones on the right, to be mobilized or at least mobilizable politically by the president. So a lot of a lot of analysts are wondering what role they could be playing in this election. What do you think? I think it's a great point. First, I also want to point out this is not new in American history. We have been um, mobilized through non-state violent action since at least pre-Civil War. And it was also mostly on the right, but somewhat on the left with John Brown for the abolitionist cause. And then, of course, the KKK and the vast majority of uh, night rider groups, as they used to be called, fighting on the other side. And they used to be politically mobilizable as well. They were groups that at that time, Southern Democrats, the old Confederacy and Dixiecrats, this is right after the Civil War, would provide impunity to with a wink and a nod. So this goes way back in our history, and it's flared at different times. In recent years, um, it's been lesser, although militia groups tend to rise under Democratic administrations. They tend to decline under Republican administrations. That tracks what you see in other countries as well, where when private armed groups feel that they're getting what they want out of groups in power, they, they decline and, and vice versa. Um, I think what's unusual under President Trump is that instead of declining, they've grown. Or they, they've at least grown in threat. It's a little hard to track exact numbers and so on of secretive groups. I think that has to do with the fact that they feel empowered. They feel that they have some support. I mean, this president has been asked numerous times to speak against white supremacy, and he's always used words. It's the only time he picks his words very carefully. You know, he, he uses words that really uh, don't do the denunciation that one would wish a president would do. So I think they are emboldened, and I think they are a factor. Now, I think they might be a bigger factor in certain ways if the president wins than if he loses. This is, as ICG tracks in other countries, the phenomenon of victory lap violence. And I think you could see if you have a presidential win in the sense that he's got a mandate, a much uh, broader set of hate crimes and so on, as these groups feel emboldened, feel that they have the administration at their back, feel that the DOJ won't prosecute them under federal laws like the Ku Klux Klan Act vis-a-vis -vis if he loses, and they might be angry and upset and possibly in the street, but they won't feel the same sense of mandate necessarily. Now, that's, of course, only at the federal level. There's also state-level issues that matter in America. I mean, one question I have about, about those groups is there does seem to be an emerging consensus along the lines of what you just said, that they are becoming more dangerous. 
And in fact, I think the Homeland Security Department's threat assessment that just came out identified them as the preeminent threat to the homeland at this point. But the question is, you know, what what's the answer to that? S- suppose a, a new administration comes in and needs to chart its course with respect to those groups. I imagine that there are probably new prosecutorial tools that could be introduced. But do you think that there's any risk that targeting these groups for greater sort of state action could produce an escalatory spiral, the kinds of things that we look at in other countries where you come in with a heavy hand, um, there's a reaction formation and things end up actually getting worse rather than better. If that's the case, how do you thread that needle so that you're countering these threats appropriately, but not creating a situation where you end up accentuating polarization as a result? It's a terrific question. It's certainly what we saw under Bill Clinton with the militias, uh, the standoffs at that point in the the early 90s and the strength that they got from uh, heavy-handed enforcement. I think it's it's a careful needle to thread. You would usually expect a number of these groups to rise under a Democratic administration, just as they have in the past. You've seen that at the state level as Democrats took over states like Virginia, Second Amendment sanctuary movements uh, just expanded and exploded. Same with New Mexico and other states where Democrats gained uh, trifectas. So you can expect that. Now, I think it is worth separating all these groups. There's militias, there's white supremacist groups, there's the Boogaloo movement. You know, we're now all becoming fluent in this language, but they're not all the same. So there are people who belong to militias who think that what they're doing is lawful. Now, it's not. It's not lawful to have private armies, but uh, that law needs to be enforced. And people need to be made aware that they have Second Amendment rights, but they're not allowed to form private armies in almost every uh, part of the 50 states has laws against that. And then there's white supremacy. It's not illegal to hold noxious, horrible views. It is illegal to act on those in violent ways, of course. And so that's for the FBI to track. And as you said, DHS has made this the number one threat as they see. So CSIS is also, uh, it's a think tank in, in Washington, declared this the number one threat. And then there's groups like the Boogaloo movement who are trying to bring across a war of some sort. They really want a racial reckoning and there are African-American groups that are growing. So when you look at all of these non-state actors, my last book was actually looking at extreme violence in democracies. And what I had found in other democracies that had faced extreme violence, much more than we're facing now, was that they had to do two things that were somewhat counterintuitive. It was this sort of Texas two-step from the left and the right. They had to enforce the laws and they really had to enforce them quite seriously and with a lot of publicity against bad actors. So this is really going after militia groups, really going after white supremacists through the FBI, using the tools of government to say, look, we have laws, you just can't do this. The same, I would say, with property crime by the left and the the sorts of crimes we're seeing on, on that side, very fair and equal enforcement. At the same time, you need to make a more inclusive society. You can't have a part of society that is scared of law enforcement, that feels that the government itself is against them, that feels put out. And now you're seeing that from, I would say, white and black in America. You're seeing that from both sides, which is part of why we're so at each other's throats, is this level of disenfranchisement, not legally disenfranchisement, but the sense that their voices aren't heard, their votes don't matter, and so on. That's why we, you know, we talk all the time about the who's voting for Trump, who's voting for Biden, we don't talk about the 45% of Americans who probably won't vote at all. That's the real voice that's, that's the problem here. And we need to find a way to make our society answerable to that part of our citizenship. So I'm sure it'd be striking to those uh, who are listening from outside the U.S. how familiar some of this may sound. And just for, for those who may not know, the Second Amendment is the, is the amendment to the Constitution that enshrines the right to bear arms. Now it's been interpreted in very different ways. But just to make the point that the U.S. is awash in weapons, more weapons than per capita than any other uh, developed or industrialized nation, I think by a very large margin. And that's one of those factors that we identify. But I, I want to come back. This was fascinating to think of sort of long term how one is going to deal with these armed groups. If we come back to the period, as you said, maybe election day goes okay. But uh, what what uh, we wrote in the in the statement and are going to come out and we'll be writing in a report as well is that there are scenarios under which the outcome won't be known on November third. They may actually last quite some time. You may even have some various claims of victory and uh, attempts to challenge votes, uh, mail-in votes. What we've been trying to focus on is what are the steps that can be taken today or tomorrow and and right after the election by Republicans, by Democrats, by outside non-Americans to try to make sure that that we don't see an institutional crisis which could give rise to violence. What are your thoughts if you've spoken to people on both sides of the aisle 
about how willing they might be to stand up and say, sorry, accept the result of the election or wait for the result of the election to have been certified before you pronounce that you are your victor in order to try to tamp down the risks of, uh, of things getting out of hand. So those are great questions. And to me, those are the, the main questions. Your report was excellent, by the way. I thought it was really hit the nail on the head. All ICG reports tend to be. But in terms of what we do next, I think, first of all, the problems reside in a handful of states, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin. Those are the big concerns. Because of the United States' very odd system of voting, we've got the sort of 18th century system of voting. The Constitution gives states the right to set the vote. So it's an extremely federalized system, and states often devolve that power to municipalities and localities. So we really don't have one election. We have about 13,000 elections across the country run by different jurisdictions, each of which has their own rules and their own ballot printing and so on. And so you're likely to see some problems in various places. And we tend to have problems in every election. Those are not destructive of an entire election. Uh, you know, anyone who's monitored elections, as I have overseas, knows that problems happen. What's different this time is a president who says that any problem means fraud. And I would say on the left as well, there's been so much talk of voter suppression, which though real, also makes people primed for fraud. So you see both sides with numbers at 82, 83% saying that if their candidate loses, they'll believe this has been a fraudulent election. Uh, that's enormously problematic. That has to do with the media bubbles everyone is in and how much they think they're likely to win. Obviously, it can't both be right at levels of 82 or 83%. So, you know, in terms of what we do, how do we move forward? I think internationally, there's not too much that internationals can do. America is particularly impervious to international opinion right now. I think there are times when we've cared more about it. But right now, you might actually see a backlash from a Trump White House and from certain governors saying, not only do we not care about your opinion, but the fact that you have offered it actually makes us want to double down. There might be quiet opinions that could be offered to the president by people he trusts and likes internationally that would be useful, a kind of a mediation process of the sort that we see in, frankly, very problematic elections in certain countries where you have quiet whispering in the ear of the chief executive that it's time to go. If Biden is the one who seems to be uh, losing and needs to step down, I fear less that that won't happen. I think I think he is likely to use all available legal means to fight in courts. And then if that fails, I think his team will say, okay, you know, game over and, and time to step down. In terms of our military, I think our military very much wants to be non-politicized and it is a very non-political factor in the United States. But we have a Department of Homeland Security, we have local police forces, and we have National Guard forces under the command of governors. And understanding just how federalized our elections are matter because a governor in a state that doesn't want a state to vote a certain way could use law enforcement to try to achieve those outcomes. I think it would be unlikely but not impossible. And those governors have a lot of power in those states. It's interesting, isn't it, that this federalization that you're describing is both a little bit of a guardrail in terms of making it more difficult to rig an election from a command central in Washington, D.C., but it also multiplies the sources of potential manipulation and the number of potential flashpoints across states and localities, doesn't it? That's exactly right. I mean, there's, there's a lot more power to go around. Um, my father used to say that the founders took all the power in our country, put it in a crystal ball, and then broke the ball. And everybody gets a shard. And, you know, that's good in terms of if a foreign actor wants to get our voter rolls and change things, they can't. They just, there are no central voter rolls. They're all state by state. However, it does mean that if a state isn't taking care of itself or is trying to manipulate, it is easier to uh, affect one state. That doesn't mean a do-over of an entire election, but it could mean real problems for a state. And because of the way our electoral college works, which does focus on states rather than individual people, it creates a big loophole in our, in our system. So we have sources of strength and guardrails from federalism, and we also have weakness. And we've, we also have that ideologically, of course. You know, we've always had states that were less inclusive than other states and um, parts of our government that were less desiring of all people being able to vote. And so all of these things together make it a mixed bag. And, and I'm not going to come out and say one is better than the other, but I, it does point you to where the problems are likely to lay. And they're likely to lay at very local level issues, some of which are ideological and some of which are technocratic and, and just competence and the level of change in this election. 
And let's not forget, we're in the middle of the second wave of pandemic. I think every state except Hawaii is experiencing an uptick. Um, if it's not every state, it's nearly every state is experiencing an uptick. People are being told to stay home again. Things are closing down again. You know, we've had a huge wave of early voting, but there's still about two thirds of our electorate who usually would vote who haven't voted yet. And how all of this plays out on election day is anyone's guess. This is Hold Your Fire, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. Today, we're talking with Rachel Kleinfeld. Just to go back to the scenarios we were painting that could create a period of indecision after Election Day, votes are still being counted for any number of reasons. There's legal contestation along the lines of what you were just describing. One of the scenes, one of the memorable scenes that emerged from the last sort of fractious post-election day period, which was during the 2000 election, when Florida was the sort of center of everybody's attention because its electoral votes were gonna end up determining who won, and there was a, a recount that was being conducted. There was a scene called the Brooks Brothers Riot, where a number of protesters swarmed a canvassing board, I think in Miami-Dade County, and interrupted the recount. And I think when people think of or worry about violent scenarios coming up in the forthcoming post-electoral period, they, they have that template in mind, but expanded. I wonder if you could react to that potential scenario and talk about whether or not that's instructive for this, for this period. Sure. So I think um, there are two kinds of violence that we can e expect if things are problematic. Or, oh, let me say three, t three kinds, actually. One is narrowly focused on areas where recounts and so on are happening in order to affect the actual vote. So this would be right after the election is over in states like uh, Pennsylvania and Wisconsin, where you can't start counting absentee ballots until after polls close on election day. Michigan has one extra day, but possibly Michigan too. Pennsylvania's laws are a particular mess. I don't have a more technical term for it. They're just really difficult. And um, I think we can expect that if the election turns on Pennsylvania, we are in for trouble. You know, if Florida comes out strong, maybe not. But if the election turns on Pennsylvania or to a lesser extent, Wisconsin and then Michigan, it's going to take a while. We have more uh, litigation right now in the courts than we've ever had before in an election. And part of that has to do with the pandemic and all the changes. Um, but a lot of it is pandemic related polarization based on partisanship. So you're right. We might have a couple of days of an election. We might have a couple of weeks of an election. And in a worst case scenario, I mean, if you think of the Al Franken election for senator in um, Minnesota, that took eight months to resolve. This can't take eight months. We have a date for uh, inauguration on January 20th that we can't get around. But it could take that long. I mean, you can envision and um, Ned Foley, Edward Foley and Larry Diamond have a particularly horrific piece, uh, beautifully written, horrific in its findings of just how you could get a problem that went all the way to inauguration day and uh, Ned serves with me on the National Election Crisis Task Force. So you could have these periods of contestation. What could you see in terms of violence? One area would be during the initial vote count, you could have the kinds of Brooks Brothers riots or real riots outside certain areas where ballots were being counted. I mean, who counts ballots in our country? Our polls are manned by election volunteers, and often those volunteers are women over 60. That's the majority of them. These are women, uh, often part of what we call the League of Women Voters. It's a very nonpartisan, good government group from the progressive era and earlier that sits there on their folding metal chairs and is helping count ballots. We also have machines in some states, but because of the pandemic and the lack of funding for the election, um, you're going to have a lot of people just trying to count ballots late into the night in uncomfortable situations who can't necessarily have shifts, places like Michigan have barred shifts trying to do their best. There will be mistakes made. Those mistakes will be able to be litigated and people will litigate them. And you're going to have a growing vocal protest and counter protest movement outside would be my guess, trying to affect that. And you'll probably hear them on the inside. I mean, you can imagine how scary that is. You're a 65 year old woman trying to just do your job. And here's this loud and people can carry guns openly in a lot of the United States. And so, you know, that can be quite scary. I'm expecting that if we have problems in a place like Pennsylvania. It doesn't necessarily mean it's violent. It does mean it's intimidating and, and scary. However, our elections are mostly national now. It used to be that elections were over local issues, but now this is a referendum on Trump. And so if you start seeing shenanigans or people imagining that there are shenanigans in certain states, you're likely to see protests and counter-protests all over the country. 
After 2016, we saw women's marches in 700 jurisdictions. They ranged from ADAC, which is a tiny community on the Aleutian Island chain that had 10 people come out um, from Alaska. So, you know, they were representing uh, Alaska, you know, all the way to Washington, D.C., where you had a half a billion people on the National Mall. So you can imagine if people are feeling that this election was fraudulent, that kind of protest movement and protests bringing out counter protesters and that kind of problem. So that's area two of violence. And then area three is to the degree that security forces get involved, what's their posture? Um, what are their rules of engagement? If they are mostly National Guardsmen and women trained in civil unrest who know how to take a very calm posture and not exacerbate the situation, that could be great. If they're uh, local law enforcement who are taking a side or who are seen as taking a side, or if they're National Guardsmen and women who are taking a very aggressive posture to dominate a space, or God forbid, if the president called out the Insurrection Act and had active duty military on the streets to quell protest, as he would say, that would be extremely bad from an escalatory situation. Well, Rachel, uh, really want to thank you. Um, I want to say, you know, I hope that a week or so from now, we all look back and say, well, this is a great what if discussion about an if that never occurred. I think we all are, are really hoping for that. And it, it's striking for me, and I'm sure it's striking for our listeners, uh, again, who may not be familiar with the U.S., how convoluted a system the American system is and how much cleanup would be required to make sure that so much of what we're talking about, which sounds so antiquated, will not get in the way of a, of a widely viewed as fair election. And the U.S. spends a lot of time dispensing lessons to others. They maybe should take a little time cleaning up its, its own act. But I couldn't think of a better person to have today, just days before the election. It really was uh, sometimes worrying, but always a real pleasure to, to listen to you. Well, thank you, Rob. And thank you, Stephen. It's always a pleasure to talk with ICG. And um, I'll just end on, on the note that, you know, America's been through worse before, and I think uh, we will probably make it through this. And the level of trust is what matters most in every society. And in ours, trust resides at the local level. So while the system's antiquated, it does rest on the one pillar of trust we really have left, and we can build from there. And I think that that's a lesson for ours and for other societies in terms of the importance of not losing that, that social cohesion. Thanks so much. Thank you. Hold Your Fire, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. So Steve, I thought that was a really fascinating conversation that we just had with, with Rachel. I also want to mention a documentary I just watched, which really resonated with what Rachel was talking about in terms of the polarization in this country, but, but it applies elsewhere as a result of social media. It's called The Social Dilemma. For those of you who could see it, I thought it was extraordinarily instructive. I thought it was a great documentary, too. I watched it with my family. I also thought Rachel was incredibly insightful. The question that we didn't get to talk about with her, which is how do you resolve the polarization that's sort of at the root of the little mini crisis we're facing right now? I don't know the answer to that question. But again, that's a reason to have her back, I think. Yeah. Uh, this has been a busy week in terms of publications and things uh, that, that, that we've issued, a statement on the risk of violence in the U.S. election a report looking more in depth about you know how, how violence might unfold and what can be done to uh, prevent it, a uh, publication on the landslide victory in Bolivia, which laid to rest some fears of, of fraud, a statement on the unrest in Nigeria, uh, a report on relations between Georgia and Russia, commentary on the Islamic State and the lessons one could draw from what it's done in Lake Chad, and finally, uh, a, a report on how Europe can help Lebanon overcome its economic implosion. So a lot of work. Thank you, Steve, for all the work you put into uh, all of those and everyone, all of our colleagues who put in tremendous time and effort to getting all this done. That's it for this week. Thanks again, Steve. It was really, really great having you on the show. To all of you, if you have any questions, please send them to media at crisisgroup.org. If you can, leave a rating or review to iTunes or Apple Podcasts. And again, I just want to thank the entire Crisis Group team that's responsible for putting this podcast together week in, week out. Couldn't do it without you. Thanks to you and to everyone out there. Have a good week. Hold Your Fire, a podcast by the International Crisis Group.